Um, now, another issue that arises is which comparative statics are relevant, right? So in the one-dimensional case, we just wanted to say if I raise the supply, the price should go down. In the multi-dimensional case, the natural extension of that is something like the law of demand, which is that if I raise the supply of just one good, the price of that particular good should go down. Or a more general version of that is that if I take some vector of goods and I raise their prices in some proportions, then the same weighting, sorry, their uh, supply in some proportions, then the same weighting of the prices should go on average down. Um, or another version of that is that if something that's equivalent to that is that if I raise the price of any individual, if I raise the supply of any individual good, but then I hold fix the price of some of the other goods, then the price of that good should go down regardless of which other goods prices I hold fix. Okay. Um, the harder thing is what's the right notion of stability, and that is this thing called uh, destability or stability independent of adjustment speeds. And what the heck does that have to do with? Well, the basic idea is that um, when markets are stable depends on the rate at which you allow things to adjust. So imagine, before I said, let's change one of the prices. And then let's see whether things converge back. Well, in a general setting, right, where you have a lot of different markets and things aren't symmetric, whether things converge back might depend on whether this market is moving more quickly than the other market is. Because otherwise, things might overshoot in one market and get into some part of the space where then it diverges. And if you want things not to depend on those relative speeds, if you want things to converge regardless, that requires one condition. If you want it to converge in some case, then that requires another condition. That wouldn't be the case if the thing were symmetric, turns out. But in this more general setting, there is this divergence between converging in some cases and converging in all cases. Um, and destability is the condition that's required for it to converge in all cases. Yeah, James. So when we're thinking about stability here, we're yep. thinking about uh, it uh, converging back to the equilibrium after a shock. Um, destability being it oscillates around the equilibrium and never gets there, or is it it goes over to a different equal, a shock can send it over to a different sort of system? That, that's a good question. So the idea is, imagine that we, perturb, we keep every fundamental in the economy the same, but we perturb the price in some, reason, for, in some way. Destability says that regardless of the relative speeds at which the markets adjust, we always end up back at the equilibrium that we started at as long as the price movement is sufficiently close to the equilibrium. So that's, that's what these stability means. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> yes, I was thinking stability. stability would be that it, it never gets back to that. Uh, that particular that equilibrium. Particular, but it could end up at another equilibrium. Yeah. OK. Exactly. Um. OK. So yes, go ahead. How would you, in any way, test for instability in the general economy? Um, well, I mean, my belief is that the economy never rests at an unstable point. So I view it sort of more as an untestable axiom. But one way that you can test it is to try to show that you know things never violate these comparative static conditions. Because these comparative static conditions are equivalent to the market behaving in a stable way in the same way that uh, maximization is equivalent to the law of demand. So if you want to test the law of demand, I mean, if you want to test maximization, the way that we do it always involves uh, making sure that people obey uh, the law of demand because that's the observable implication of individual maximization. right? And the observable implication of stability is in the same way that the aggregate economy obeys the law of demand. OK, so um, all of this uh, is useful for game theory, not just for general equilibrium theory. And the reason is that game theory, at least when you know, people have continuous actions, 
are, is determined, determines a system of equations that everyone has to satisfy. Right? You know, like everyone has a first order condition and the equilibrium is that everyone satisfies their first order condition. And because it's not an individual maximization problem, the gradient of all those first order conditions doesn't need to be symmetric in the same way that uh, the you know, income effects make things need, uh, not need to be symmetric. Um, and so I think in some ways this whole discussion is most useful in the context of game theory rather than general equilibrium theory. And the reason is that often in general equilibrium theory, income effects are not really that large or not that important to us at least. So we know, for example, that Giffen goods can occur in principle, but we know that in practice they're very, very rare because the good would have to be such a big part of your income for it to occur that we don't really think it'll happen. And in the same way, these asymmetries can in principle be important, but in practice usually aren't very important because uh, we don't think income effects are that large. Right? So, um, when income effects are not large, then any market is going to behave just like an individual because it's only income effects that cause the divergence between those two things. Um, and that will mean that everything will be Slutsky symmetric, it'll be stable. All the things that you like about individual maximization problems will apply to market problems when we don't have big income effects. And this makes our life much nicer so I want to go through some of the reasons why basically throughout most of the rest of the course we're going to ignore income effects. So one reason is sort of quantitative. We're going to, I want to look at how big income effects have to be before they matter. And then um, second, I'll give a more theoretical argument about what the relevant sort of income is that's on the denominator when we think about whether something's a big part of income. Okay. So um, Bobby Willig did some calculations about how large income effects have to be to matter. Um, and it, you know, the question is, matter for what? Well, consumer surplus is really simple to calculate. All these compensating variations, equivalent, that stuff's all messy, right? Um, stability is a really nice uh, property. And we'd like to not have to worry about you know, destability versus all this other stuff, getting rid of income effects gets rid of that problem. Uh, symmetry, which we, is a nice thing that we like from individual maximization problem, returns. So the question is, um, how close, let's focus on the first one of these, just the ways quantifying these. This is a little bit harder to quantify how far we are away from symmetry. So um, the, que uh, the question I want to ask is, how close is consumer surplus to this ideal measure we would want? Like, equivalent variations or compensating variations, et cetera. So let's let A be the amount of a standard consumer surplus change that we would calculate. And let's let I be someone's lifetime income. And let's let eta be the income elasticity. Now we know income elasticities can be greater or less than one, but usually they're pretty darn close to one, right? I mean, sometimes maybe they're three or a half, but not very much further off from that. So what Willig showed, is that the relative error that we get from using consumer surplus relative to uh, using the ideal measure is going to be less than the income elasticity multiplied by the amount of the consumer surplus change divided by two times the person's lifetime income. Why is that intuitive? Well, any divergence comes from income effects. And the income elasticity says, uh, this is how much the change is as a fraction of your income. Multiply that by an elasticity, and you're going to get basically the size of the income effects. Right? So this is a very simple formula. So imagine that um, the elasticity, as I was saying, is less than 3. Right? Um, then uh, if this is no more than 1% of your lifetime income, then you always get an error of less than 1.5%. And 1% of someone's lifetime income is a big change for most people. So someone's lifetime income might be uh, you know, a, a million, $10 million, something like that. 1% of that is like $10,000 or $100,000, right? So this, in most cases, 
is going to be very small compared with measurement error. Think about the measurement error you usually get. It's like 20, 30 percent in most estimates. The error you get from not considering all this complicated stuff about income effect is going to be pro almost certainly less than 1.5 percent. So usually it's not worth worrying about this stuff. This is just calibrationally tiny, right? Um, and this is very related to, I don't know if anyone's ever read this paper by Matthew Rabin about uh, risk aversion and expected utility at calibration theorem. But what he says is that calibrationally, in any real world situation, even though risk aversion might exist overall, no one is going to be risk averse over any stakes that we usually talk about in standard small problems. Yeah, go ahead, Alex. Is this um, formula true regardless of the distribution of incomes? Yes, as long as it's true for every person. So you would have to add up over all the people what fraction of their income the consumers are. But yes, if you aggregate in the correct way, it's true. Um, so to make clear how broadly this applies, let's consider some simple examples. So Bob Lucas, and I don't believe this. This is crazy. But Bob Lucas claims that um, all business cycles in, in all of history uh, don't account for more than 0 .0047 of, um, uh, you know, of GDP. So if that's the case, then if we left all income effects out of macro, that wouldn't lead to error of more than 1%. Uh, now, I'm not saying that he's right about that. But if he were right about that, or even if he was an order of magnitude off, we still wouldn't get much error by leaving all income effects out of macro. Um, Costino et al. Uh, are going to say below that Ricardian uh, trade is not going to uh, generate income effects of, I'm sorry, welfare gains of more than 0.05%. So that means in all Ricardian models that we consider, if we neglect all income effects, that won't lead to an error of more than 8% in our analysis of, the, of welfare. Wait, is it 0.05% or 5%? No, 0 0.05. That's 5%, sorry. So it won't lead to more than 8%. Okay. And these are like super macro things, right? Like all Ricardian trade that occurs in the entire world. Or all business cycles, right? So for almost anything we would, standard thing we would talk about in real microeconomics, this is going to matter even less, right? And, and you know, one key reason is that I was dividing everything by people's lifetime incomes, right? Because that's the relevant income for an individual, right? So for a standard professor, this would be something like $5 million. Most things we consider are going to be small relative to this. So like a particular election, you almost certainly wouldn't be willing to pay more than 1000 bucks, or most people wouldn't be willing to pay more than 1000 bucks to see their favorite candidate win. So if we ignore all income effects and thinking about the distributive consequences of elections, this is like our error is going to be like three hundredths of one percent, right? So income effects are sort of irrelevant to thinking about almost anything in political economy. Um, doubling the price of the car that you buy, which is way bigger than any of the effects that we ever think about in I.O. models of the car industry. Uh, would only probably increase the price by about $20,000, and so it would probably only lead to an error of half of a percent. So it would be crazy to include income effects in any I.O. model, right? Um, eliminating all fees on investments ever, right? Which would be a huge gain to lots of people. Um, that's about $30,000 would be that change, and that would still be less than a percent. Yeah, go ahead. Um, to me, this permanent income hypothesis is like very shady because for that to be true, like, I feel like you would have, even if you knew what you were going to make in your lifetime, it's already kind of well. Yeah. 